the faculty. Okay, so I'm going to be uh, presenting uh, some of the things that we've been kind of working on for the last couple of years on uh, active authentication. Okay, so let me uh, introduce the um, the topic. So some of you might know the website uh, rocku.com. It's the uh, company that makes the software for uh, social networking sites like uh, Facebook and MySpace. So in 2000, late 2009, uh, an unknown hacker they uh, put on the server for some time. So researchers and some hackers were able to download it. And what the researchers found was that uh, nearly 1% of these 32 million uh, users had their password as one, two, three, four, five, six, okay? And here's a list of five commonly used passwords, okay, from 2009. And what is even more interesting is that they had a pool of 5,000 commonly used passwords, okay? And 20% of the passwords came from that pool. So what that means is that uh, a hacker can easily gain access to many accounts by simply trying the most common passwords, okay? And the list hasn't really changed much in the last five years. So one, two, three, four, five, six is still the most common password, okay? So this is uh, pretty interesting, right? When it comes to uh, the mobile devices, things aren't any different, okay? So most mobile devices uh, use uh, PIN numbers, passwords, or maybe some sort of uh, uh, secret pattern to authenticate users, right? So perhaps you can easily hack into uh, many cell phones just by typing one, two, three, four, or A, B, C, D, right? Secret patterns aren't that uh, safe either. Uh, we keep using the same patterns over and over again. So we leave the smudge marks on the, on the device. And with a special camera, high resolution camera, and special lighting, you can deduce the, uh, the secret pattern, okay? So these patterns are not that safe either. Furthermore, as long as the device is active, there is a mechanism to verify that the user uh, originally authenticated is still in charge of the device, right? So how do we continuously authenticate a mobile device user, okay? This is the topic uh, that I'm gonna be presenting today. Okay, so here's the outline, basically. I'll introduce the, uh, kind of introduce the notion of active authentication. I'll present two modalities that we kind of introduced. And I'll present, um, some of the issues that we have to overcome to make this uh, practical, okay? And then I'll demo, uh, I'll show you a couple of videos that kind of shows you how we implemented this thing, okay? So active authentication, right? So if you look at uh, a recent uh, smartphone, right? It comes with a variety of different sensors, like a gyroscope, uh, accelerometer, a camera, a microphone, a GPS sensor, and so on and so forth. So the idea is to somehow make use of these sensors to continuously authenticate users, okay? Well, one thing we can do is to kind of view how users interact with the phone, okay? Based on how they behave on the touch screens, okay? For instance, um, Siantan swipes differently than I do, right? Uh, his area of finger, uh, the finger, finger, his area is different than uh, my finger. Uh, the, the amount of pressure that he applies while swiping on the touch screen is different than I, I would, and so on and so forth. Uh, orientation is something uh, useful too, because some people often prefer using a, a portrait mode. Some people like to use it in a landscape. So we can use all this information to extract some sort of feature which can be used to continuously authenticate users, right? The other thing we propose is uh, based on the, the front-facing camera. So, I can use a video captured by the front-facing camera and perhaps do facial recognition to continuously authenticate user, okay? So these are the two things that we propose to uh, continuously authenticate users. So what we have done here is uh, these are some of the users doing normal things on their mobile devices and they're not aware that they've been kind of captured, okay? So these are the images taken in a stealth mode and you can easily see that we can capture uh, their faces uh, reasonably well, right? So in order to do this study, we had to collect data, right? So because there is no publicly available data set that combines or that captures both the uh, touch gestures and faces simultaneously. So we uh, came up with uh, a data collection scenario. We used the iPhone 5S. We collected data from uh, 50 individuals. Um, 
and we collect the data in three different sessions corresponding to different illumination conditions, uh, mainly in a well-lit room, something like this room, uh, in a dim-lit room, and in a natural illumination environment. Uh, we had uh, five tasks per session, and uh, in general, we uh, collected um, about 750 videos and corresponding touch data. Okay? And these are the, the tasks that we came up with. The, for the enrollment task, we asked users to uh, kind of face the front-facing camera and uh, uh, kind of move their head left and right, up and down, so we can get, capture all the poses. For the scroll test, we uh, showed a user a um, collection of images um, that were arrayed horizontally and vertically. Okay? And the users would have to kind of swipe their fingers to kind of go through them one at a time. So that way we can capture their swipes. And at the same time, we captured their facial information as well. For the document test, we uh, showed a user uh, a PDF document of a, it's a research article. And we asked the users to kind of go through the document and find the number of figures or find the number of tables and so on and so forth. So that way they have to kind of swipe their fingers up and down and go through the document, right? For the pop-up test, we had a, an image popping up in the corner of uh, the image, uh, corner of the, the iPhone, and the user would have to drag it and center it uh, in the middle of the, the iPhone. So that way we can capture the swipe as well. And for the picture test, uh, we had a, a poster-like image uh, shown here. And uh, it had about 72 cars, and uh, we asked them to count the number of black cars and so on and so forth. So that way they have to kind of go through the entire image, uh, and we can capture the swipes and so on and so forth. So this way we were able to capture multiple swipes in different uh, situations. And at the same time, we had uh, their uh, facial videos. So these are some uh, sample videos that we collected. So this is the enrollment video. This is what the video would look like. So a user would uh, rotate their head from left and right, up and down. And this is important for facial recognition because you want to capture all the poses, right? And here is a video where we do a, for a document test. Right? So the person is uh, performing uh, the document test and we are kind of capturing. He doesn't know that he's being captured. But this is what a video would look like. Right? And uh, finally, we have this uh, scroll test. Right? And you can see there are some variations that we have to overcome. There is a blur. Uh, sometimes you see a partial face and so on and so forth. Right? So the idea is basically we take these videos and extract some, you know, the, do the face detection, extract some features, and continuously monitor the user. Okay? These are some sample uh, touch swipes, okay? So we have four different tasks, two different individuals. They perform the same task, but their swipes are different. Okay, so this clearly shows that you can actually use this swipe information to distinguish uh, among different users, right? In particular, if you look at this swipe, it's very densely sampled compared to, for instance, this swipe. What that means is that this user, this user is applying a lot more pressure while swiping. And this user is very quick. Right? So given this swipe, how do we come up with a feature? What is a feature that we should use, which can be fed into a classifier to continuously authenticate a user? Right? So we come up with this 29-dimensional feature based on a swipe. Okay? And essentially, what we do is we look at the, uh, the start location, the end location, the, the velocity, the acceleration, the amount of pressure you apply, the area covered by the finger, and so on and so forth the orientation and so on and so forth, right? So each swipe will give us this 29-dimensional feature vector. And we do that for each and every swipe. And then we fit this into a classifier. For face recognition, given a video, we first have to do face detection. If we detect the faces, then we do a so-called landmark detection. So we want to identify where the eyes are, where the, nose, where the nose is, and where the mouth is, and so on and so forth. So we do a fiducial point detection. And based on the fiducial points, we align the image or we extract the features. And once we extract the features, we can use them for the classification, right? So these are some examples of good detections, okay, where we were able to capture the faces from a video. And here are the uh, landmarks uh, on the detected faces, right? And here are some examples where uh, the detection fails. And you can see why it fails, right? Because you have a, a lot of motion blur. Uh, even I cannot see who the person is here. Uh, illumination is very intense. There is a close-up image there. So this fiducial point detection as well as the face detection fails in this case. Right? So these are some of the challenges we have to overcome to make the, the system 
uh, practical. Because we know where the landmarks are, we extract this so-called mean feature. Essentially stands for the, the, the mouth, left eye, right eye, and nose. Okay? Because we know where the, where the locations of the landmarks, we can extract these features. We essentially concatenate them and come up with this uh, 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 400 uh, dimensional feature vector. Okay? And we wanted to study the performance of uh, different classification methods on the data we collected, right? And in computer vision and machine learning uh, community, in the last five, six years, the sparse representation-based classification methods uh, have shown to produce uh, state-of-the-art results on a variety of uh, different uh, uh, image classification and object recognition data sets. So we wanted to evaluate uh, sparse representation-based algorithm on the data we collected here. So let me briefly review the idea behind um, the sparse representation-based classification. Okay, so let's say we're given uh, multiple images uh, corresponding to the i-th class, okay, which is shown here. And we're also given a test sample from that class, i-th class. Then we can write this sample as a linear combination of the training set, right? But in practice, we don't know the identity, right? And if you have C different classes, then we can still write this test image as a linear combination of all the training samples. And the interesting property about this coefficient vector that I obtained is that most of the coefficients are zero, except for those corresponding to the i class. So what we can say about this vector is that this vector is sparse. It, most of the coefficients are equal to zero. Okay? So more mathematically, what we have is we concatenate all the training samples into a matrix Y, and we have a test vector YT. We want to write this as a linear combination of these training samples, and we are looking for this vector X, which is sparse. The way we find this sparsest vector is by solving this optimization problem. And once we find this coefficient, we can use it for classification. Okay? And the classification rule is very simple. What we do is we look at the training samples corresponding to a particular class and the coefficients corresponding to that particular class and try to recover the image and compare it with the test sample. And we do this for all the classes and look at the reconstruction errors and we identify the class of a novel test image as the one that gives us the lowest reconstruction error. Okay? So this is very simple yet very effective and this was uh, basically uh, the algorithm that came out of uh, UIUC in Berkeley. And uh, this algorithm is uh, very effective, especially for a lot of biometric uh, recognition problems, okay? And you can write this in terms of inner products, okay? So you can easily kernelize it. What that means is that you can map the data onto high dimensional feature space and then find a representation on that feature space. So you can deal with uh, non-linearities that are present in the data. So we apply this and compare it with the uh, standard SVM algorithm where we use the, uh, the, the, the RBF kernel or Gaussian kernel, and we see that when we use only one swipe, okay, to make uh, the prediction, then we are into like seven, the, the, the sparse representation algorithm is around 70, okay? So what we've done here is uh, we have data from three different sessions, right? We kind of combine all the data, and we uh, randomly selected 80 swipes per class for training and the rest of the swipes for testing, okay? And what this means is that if I use only one swipe to make a prediction, th this, is the, this is what I can do with the sparse representation-based algorithm and the uh, SVM-based algorithm. And for a k-swipe classification, we apply a single-swipe classification k times and do majority voting on the predicted labels. Okay? So as I increase the number of swipes to make the classification, you can see that the numbers improve tremendously. So what this really shows is that the, the swipes can be used uh, for continuous authentication, right? We did a similar experiments, but in, in the case of phases, we had the enrollment phase, right? So we use the data uh, corresponding to the enrollment phase for training and the rest of the data for testing, okay? From the other sessions for uh, other tasks for testing. So when we use the data uh, in session one uh, for training and the other task for testing, we, we do it in uh, upper, I mean lower 90s, in some cases mid 90s, right? So this is promising. And the similar trend is seen uh, with the different uh, sessions. If we append the training set by 
kind of adding more training samples uh, from the enrollment session of the other session, right? So in other words, what this means is that uh, the, the data from enrollment sessions from session one and two, and then I test it on data from the other task on session one, then the improvement is not that significant. It slightly improves, but it doesn't really improve it, right? So what this really shows here is that the, the faces can be used for authentication, right? That were captured from a cell phone camera. Because we collected data in different sessions, what we do now is we do cross-session classification. Okay, what this means is that we train a classifier on session one and test it on the data from session two. When we do that, we see there is a degradation in the performance. Okay? And the degradation is not that much for touch data, but when we look at the, the, uh, the face data, the degradation is tremendous. Before, the numbers were in mid-90s, but now they're in mid-40s, even below in some cases. Okay? So what is going on here? Okay? Before, we used the data, right? The training set that was used to train a classifier had a similar distribution for testing as well. Here, we have a distribution for training which is very different than the distribution that we have for testing. So this problem is very common in, uh, in machine learning and computer vision. It's known as data set bias or data set shift problem. Okay? Regardless of the cause, any distributional change that occurs after learning a classifier will degrade the performance at testing. Okay? So this is a major problem that we have to overcome somehow if we were to make this practical. Right? So how do we adapt the classifier, the sparse representation-based classifier that we train on one session to the other session? So there is a need for adaptation. Right? We have to somehow transfer the knowledge that we have from one session to the other. So this brings me to my second topic of the talk, which is domain adaptation, okay? So let me kind of introduce this idea of domain adaptation, okay? So let me define this problem. So in domain adaptation, you're given a label source data set, okay? And a partially labeled or unlabeled target data set, and you have to essentially learn a classifier for the target data set. So for the source and target, they're nothing but different sessions for us, okay? So source could be a, a, a session one, and target could be session two, or vice versa, okay? So essentially, we assume that we have a plenty of data, plenty of label data from the source data set, and very few data from the target data set. So this is shown right here. So you have D1 means domain one, and D2 means domain two, or session one or session two. So we have plenty of data from domain one, and very few data, uh, dark images, from session two. We have to design a classifier so that you can recognize images which are dark. So how do we do that? Okay. So what I will present is uh, uh, the sparse representation-based algorithm. How can we make it adaptive to different domains? Okay. But before I go there, let me uh, further motivate this problem of domain adaptation. It has a lot of implications. If you look at, if you're interested in face recognition across different modalities, then you can view this problem as adapting a classifier from visible domain to the infrared or, 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 or thermal, or vice versa. If you're interested in a, a text recognition, then you, you, you can transfer uh, the classifier from the computer generated digits to handwritten digits. Uh, you can uh, apply this method where the CT images are very easy to obtain compared to MRI images. You have availability of CT images. You have plenty of images compared to the MRI images. So you can learn a classifier for CT and adapt it to the MRI images. Uh, for object recognition, you may have different sensors, uh, res different uh, sensors, uh, sketch images, uh, different resolutions, and so on and so forth. How do I adapt the classifier that was trained on this data set to this data set, for instance? Domain adaptation will do that for you. Okay? So this problem is very general, and it, will, uh, it is applicable to a lot of these uh, problems. Okay? So going back to the problem of this domain adaptation for active authentication is that we have three different sessions, and we essentially want to learn a classifier so that the classifier doesn't see uh, variations in this data set. Okay? And we want to use this, this sparse representation-based classification for this. So the idea is the following. Okay? So let's say we have k different domains. Okay? They could be corresponding to different illumination conditions, resolutions, or uh, pose variations, or what have you. Right? So let's say you have k different domains. What we want to do is we want to find these projections that project 
data from domain one to this latent space or a common subspace, a projection two that takes the data from domain two and puts it on the common subspace so that the distributions align in this space. So right now you see that there is a very significant variation in illumination conditions. Hopefully at this point there is a not that much variation in data. So we want to find these projections and once you are at this point here you can simply apply this sparse presentation based classification algorithm because there is no degradation in data, right? The, 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 the data aligns at this point. So the question is how do we learn these projections and find the sparse representation simultaneously from data? Okay, so how do we do that? So if you look at this matrix here, what we have is this Z is nothing but uh, the original data projected onto this space using this projection P1, right? So Z is nothing but the concatenation of all the training samples using the appropriate projection matrices, right? So what I can do is I can take one sample here and write it as a linear combination of the other samples. And because I know that I have a few samples corresponding to the same class, I can look for the sparse representation. So this is exactly what I do. So this first optimization is essentially doing exactly that. It's taking one sample in this domain, I'm sorry, in this domain and writing it as a linear combination of the other samples. But when you write it in terms of all the data, this is how you write it basically, okay? And these are the definitions of these matrices, which combines all the domains together, okay? So this essentially finds the sparse representation in the common subspace. But we want to learn the projections, right? So what we do is we add a regularization so that the projections don't lose too much information. What that means is that I have a projection that projects this data onto this latent space. And if I can recover it, then I want to make sure that the recovered image compares uh, it's very close to the original image that I started with. So this is captured right here, okay? So this is a regularization term that we add. And then we also require the, uh, the rows of the projection matrices to be orthogonal, okay? And when we put all these things together, this is the overall optimization that we want to solve, okay? So the input to the algorithm is nothing but you know, data from different domains. The output is nothing but these projection matrices, right? And here's the overall algorithm, basically. The way we solve it is uh, in an iterative way, okay? What we do is we first fix P and solve for X, and then we fix X and solve for P. So this is the overall optimization. When we fix P, right, these terms disappear, basically. This is not there, and we essentially have to solve this problem. And this problem is a sparsity promoting optimization problem. You can use off-the-shelf optimization algorithms. You can use this uh, alternating direction method of multipliers, so-called ADMM method that uh, a lot of people use um, to solve this problem. When you fix X and update P, this is a problem that you have to solve. And this is essentially the problem of trace minimization with multiple orthogonality constraints. This problem is non-convex because you have multiple orthogonality constraints. Right? So this problem can also be solved solve with the off-the-shelf off the uh, optimization tools. In particular, we use this uh, method of splitting orthogonality constraint by um, um, Stanley Osher, okay? So just to recap, we have this optimization problem. We solve it in an iterative way by fixing one variable, updating the other, and we iterate uh, until um, we are satisfied with the we have some sort of you know, switch that says that, okay, we're, we're okay. The, 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 the norm doesn't change much or you just define a predetermined number of iterations, okay? So this is something that you have to work on. So here's the uh, overall algorithm, okay? So given training set from different domains, we learn these projections. Once we learn these projections, we uh, project the original data onto the latent space, given a novel test image, knowing where the domain it comes from, we use the learned projection and project it onto that space and essentially solve this partial presentation based classification method. Okay? So do you have any questions? Right? All right, yeah. So the idea is every time you use the phone, um, you would imp, uh, kind of add that yeah. uh, session to the training. Right. And so how, I guess there's the constraint with memory. 
Oh, uh, right. Uh, how, uh, how, how can you get around that? How, how do you train it? Yeah, how do you keep data, get rid of data? Yeah, so this is something, you know, for instance, this is something you have to try. I mean, we're still in the, in the, in the, in the, in the progress of kind of, you know, testing different uh, environments and, and things like that, right? But what, what we are going at here is that if you use your phone, right? If you just buy a phone from Verizon or whatever, right? You enroll yourself during the day when it's sunny outside. It's going to work for the day, right? And then in the evening, if you try to use it, the phone says, oh, you're no longer the, the owner because the ambient condition is different. It's dark outside. So how do we kind of overcome that, right? That's the idea. So if we have data from, let's say, in the morning, afternoon, at nine, and so on and so forth, that captures a variety of different illumination conditions, then perhaps the algorithm that I have will not kind of say that you should not use the phone at night, and so on and so forth, right? So that's the idea. This is something you have to do ahead of time. Once you have this, you just put it in your phone, and it should be OK. So you don't have to continuously do that, all right? So here are some results on the data that we collected, right? So for the touch data, so if you, if you see this algorithm where we don't apply any domain adaptation, right? We use uh, this session one for training, session two for testing, then this is what we can get, right? But with this domain adaptive algorithm, we can improve it uh, significantly, right? Still, the improvement is not as much as you would like it to be, right? It's still in mid-40s. Um, when we kind of use data from two different sessions, and this is known as so-called multi-source domain adaptation, and adapt it to uh, the third session, then we see that there is uh, an improvement as well. And here is the, the, the table that compares uh, the results on the phase data, right? And we see a similar trend here. So this is the, call, this is the row that we want to compare with this low. So without adaptation, we are in kind of, on average, we are in like 80s. And with adaptation, we improve it by 7 8%. OK? So this is uh, very significant. And we see a similar trend here as well. So when we learn these projections, I can visualize these rows of these projections, right? So what we have in this slide is six rows of the learned projection. And what you see is that it kind of captures the various illumination that, that happens on different data sets, right? So it kind of makes sense that it is capturing what I'm supposed to, right? So what it means is that when I take in the product of the image with this learned projection, it puts it in a space where this data align. There is a less distributional change, right? So it kind of makes sense, all right? So now I would like to kind of show uh, a preliminary implementation of this touch-based and uh, face-based uh, method that we have on a mobile device. And this is, uh, you know, Xianpen's implementation. So what you will see here is, uh, um, okay, well, it didn't come. Okay, there you go. So what you see here is uh, Siantan has enrolled himself, okay? And what he's doing here is that with every two swipes, you'll see a score appearing here, okay? So he's enrolled himself, and he usually uses his right hand to kind of swipe his finger, uh, swipe on the mobile device, right? So he's using his right hand right now, and ev with every two swipe, you will see a score appearing. And the score is around one, OK? And after some time, now he's going to use his left hand, which is not kind of normal to him. And in that case, you see the score is kind of getting higher. OK? Lower the battery, OK? And you see that the score is kind of around two. And after some time, he's going to give his phone to his uh, roommate, OK? And in that case, the numbers will even go higher, OK? Which you will see very soon. So now his roommate. He's going to use his uh, phone. And now you see that numbers should go to three. There you go. So every two swipe, you'll see a number. There you go. It's around three. So what this really shows is that, yeah, I can come up with a threshold, let's say around one, to reject uh, imposters, right? So it kind of works. It makes sense. And we have a similar thing for um, the video, uh, for the faces. And here's uh, basically what this shows is that you know, it's a, it, there's a little delay because you know, we are displaying things. But you see that Siantan is already enrolled. And you see that it's a safe mode. And he's going to give it to his uh, roommate in a second. And you'll see it's going to be unsafe. So now his roommate is using. As soon as we can capture the face, it's unsafe. Right? So it kind of works. Yeah? So are these processed on the phone? 
Yeah, completely on the phone. Yeah, it's 100%. It's real time. Like this is what you like get basically on the phone. Yeah. So Samten is the one who's been working on this. So he developed these applications for us. Yeah. So liveliness, liveliness detection is, is uh, you know, there are some attacks that people come up with, right? This is a problem in general biometrics that, you know, if you, if you, you know, this was a problem in Android devices. You know, they had like face-based authentication. You kind of put your, you know, camera in front of your face. And as soon as, you know, it can see your face, it'll authenticate you, right? And people, you know, came up with an idea. Well, what if I just put a, a photo of you, right? So this is a problem, but... Um, uh, it's a continuous authentication, right? If you hold the phone, right, how are you going to use the phone, right? I mean, you have to have, so it's kind of difficult, right? Yeah, you can spoof it, but you won't be able to use the device. And even if you have the phone, what I haven't really presented yet is what we are also doing is trying to fuse this, not only use faces, but also use the touch swipes to kind of jointly authenticate them, okay? And I actually have some slides uh, I'll show you. I wasn't planning on showing because I was told to give a talk for only 30 minutes, but I have some time, so I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that, okay? But before I go there, these are some of the students who are working on this. Uh, Santin is the one who implemented the, uh, uh, the demo. Okay, and then uh, this is funded by Google and uh, DARPA. So let me uh, briefly talk about this um, multimodal thing, right? So what we want to do here is uh, we want to fuse the information from different modalities, right? So what we did is uh, essentially uh, we came up with uh, this sparse representation-based algorithm where we extended the algorithm that I presented from one modality to multiple modalities. Without going into the details, I just want to show you some results uh, of what happens when we fuse the data. So let's say if I just rely on faces only, and uh, I, then I can do in, let's say, mid-70s. And if I use the touch data, then I'm kind of into like mid-20s, right? But when I fuse it, I do much better. So this is what you want to kind of look at, right? 70, 25, 80, that's significant, right? So we, we have that. And because we know the, the, the landmarks on the faces, we can actually face the different parts of the, the faces, right? So rather than using the entire face, the holistic face, we can kind of capture kind of components, facial components to fuse them, right? Because in some frames, you may not be able to see the entire face, for instance, here. So if we can kind of extract this left eye, right eye, kind of nose and mouth, then we can use them as independent modalities and fuse them. And we also do that here. So if you look at only one modality, then we are kind of, you know, modality one, modality two, so on and so forth. When we fuse it, it's much better. Okay? So we have some results on that as well. So with that, I'll stop here and take uh, questions if you have any. Yeah. So uh, increasingly, uh, we have seen uh, papers that focus on training in multiple domains. Right. Yeah. Um, if you train a deep network which has uh, seen data with multiple conditions of noise, right. uh, and it performs really well, amazing. But how does that compare to domain adaptation? So this representation in heterogeneous data is, is a very broad topic, right? There are different ways of looking at it. So the problem that I define here is, is called the domain adaptation, right? Where you want to kind of transfer the knowledge of a classifier from one domain to the other. Right? And it requires a specific training where you have a whole bunch of data from the source domain and a few data from the target domain. And then you can transfer the knowledge from source to target. If I already have a lot of samples from the target domain, I don't need to look at the source domain. I can just train a classifier on the target. So this falls in a very specific uh, problem, which is a domain adaptation. Now, the other problem is that you may be given data in terms of multiple views, right? So you may be given data simultaneously, the, the touch and the faces together. In that case, you can apply, there are so many multi-view methods that you can apply. So if you're interested in that topic, actually, uh, I would like to uh, mention this paper here, okay, which will appear in the uh, Signal Processing Magazine May issue, where we essentially talk about these things. We, we talk about multi-view recognition, self-taught learning, uh, transfer learning, domain adaptation, semi-supervised learning, weekly supervised learning, and we kind of make connections with different learning algorithms, okay? okay? And if you go to my website, you'll see this paper actually. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So uh, you essentially build these credentials through training, through the swipe 
yeah. or with the camera. And I could see it being useful, let's say you get a new cell phone, yeah. the Apple 6. You'd like to transfer these credentials from one phone to another. That's an excellent point. Are there, in the projection operations, are there any, is there any dependence on what type of sensor you're using? Maybe they upgrade the touch Excellent point. Camera. Excellent point, yeah. So this is exactly what I'm trying to show here, right? So I'm going to answer that in terms of object recognition, right? So if you're really, let's say, interested in recognizing backpacks or laptop or whatnot, right? Computer devices or whatnot. If I have a, a collection of images that were taken with a high resolution DSLR camera, OK, the same objects, right? And then I have another data set, which is basically the collection of same type of objects, but now I've used webcam, very low resolution cameras. And then I have a collection of images by simply doing a Google search, where I get all kinds of things, right? Uh, like uh, cartoon images and so on and so forth. So now, all of these data sets, they have the same categories, same objects. But what is different? Resolution is different. Maybe illumination is different, so on and so forth. So this problem that you mentioned of so-called sensor adaptation is a legitimate one. And you can apply this uh, method that I've discussed to that scenario as well. In fact, we have done that for uh, iris recognition. So what happened is, is that if you go to the airport, right, sometimes they take a scan of your iris. And these uh, sensors were deployed almost 15, 20 years ago. And now with the advances in sen sen sensor technology, uh, there are much better sensors that we can you know, use. right? So, but we had a whole bunch of people, millions and you know, millions of people already enrolled using really cheap old device. So do, does that mean that we have to really re-enroll them using a new sensor? We can't do that, right? So we had to come up with this adaptation technique that kind of takes you know, a knowledge from one sensor to the other. And uh, we actually have one of our students, uh, Pillai, he has a paper on exactly that topic. Yeah. So that's a legitimate point, yep. There are no other questions. Let's thank our speaker. Okay. Thank you.